Yes. All right, great. Yeah, so I'm going to be talking about uh, natural graph networks, which is an uh, exciting uh, new piece of work uh, where we are actually generalizing the no very notion of equivariance to something called naturality, a uh, concept well known in, uh, in pure mathematics. Um, and I'm very happy to be talking after uh, Haggai because a lot of the things that he explained, I will also be, uh, be uh, using uh, and uh, to a degree assume as, uh, as uh, prior knowledge. Um, I wished I could have shown you some uh, cool experimental results as well today, but unfortunately we very recently found a, a bug in our code that might invalidate uh, some of the results that we have. Uh, there's already a paper online, but uh, we're, we're going to, to revise that. Uh, so I'll, I'll just be showing some very uh, small toy experiments, but nevertheless, there's uh, some very interesting uh, theoretical insights uh, here. So I hope this will be, uh, be interesting. All right, so before we begin though, I would like to uh, say uh, one thing about uh, equivariance versus data augmentation, because that's the, uh, uh, the main topic of the, the workshop today. Uh, so here is uh, one uh, study that we did on uh, 3D uh, rotation or discrete rotation equivariant uh, convolutional nets for lung nodule detection in uh, CT scans. Uh, and what we found in this paper, uh, which is probably the, the, one of the most impressive uh, results we found with these kinds of networks, uh, in 3D you have a lot of symmetries as you can see, uh, is that uh, the equivariant net uh, had about 10x better data efficiency, meaning if we train a uh, rotation equivariant net on say 300 samples, we get roughly the same performance as a CNN on 3000 samples, and that holds across uh, data set sizes. Um, and critically, the CNN baseline actually uh, was using data augmentation. It was a state-of-the-art method uh, with a very finely tuned uh, augmentation pipeline. Uh, and actually, we're finding this uh, again and again uh, in all of our experiments, and also many other groups have, uh, have found this, uh, that equivariance tends to beat data augmentation. Um, so there are, of course, some caveats. You have to actually know the symmetries in advance. Uh, you have to, uh, the, the symmetry has to be tractable. So if you have some very large uh, number of uh, symmetries in, so, in certain ways of building equivariant nets, it can uh, become computationally inefficient. Uh, and in the case of continuous symmetries, uh, you need to also be able to implement those uh, uh, equivariant maps in a uh, numerically stable uh, manner. Um, now, why, why do we find this? What could explain this? Uh, well, there are multiple factors. So one is that if you do data augmentation, you're only putting a constraint on the network as a whole. Uh, rather than on each layer individually, which is what you do with uh, with equivariant nets. Uh, and secondly, with data augmentation, uh, you'll you'll um, it will be the case that each data point will only you know be seen during training a couple times. So each data point is coupled with a couple augmentations, and not all of them. So that's another factor. Um, and um, Finally, the data augmentation will only constrain your function on the data and not anywhere else in the space. So if with equivariant nets, you're guaranteed to be equivariant uh, everywhere in your inter input space. Uh, and so it will also generalize in a way that is consistent with the symmetry. So those are my hypothesis for why we, uh, we find this, but it's a, it's a recurring uh, finding. All right, with that said, let's continue to the main topic, natural graph networks. Uh, so this is a collaboration with uh, Pim, uh, who is uh, really leading this, uh, this work, uh, and Max Welling uh, and uh, myself. So I don't think I need to do too much uh, in terms of uh, motivating this work. Uh, graph networks are uh, becoming very popular. There's a lot of data that you can represent as a, as a graph. And so having networks that can process this type of data is, uh, is very useful. Um, now, as I always like to emphasize, uh, whenever you encounter a new problem, um, you will want to ask first, what are the symmetries of this problem? And then uh, design a network that, is, uh, that respects those symmetries, i.e. is equivariant, as uh, Haggai was also uh, mentioning. So a fully connected network uh, is good at processing vectors, uh, which have no symmetry whatsoever. Um, then there are convolutional networks and their generalizations that we call GCNNs. 
which are good at processing spatial signals or signals on time or signals on some kind of space uh, where you might have some geometrical symmetries like translation, rotation, uh, scaling, and so forth. And for graphs and also other combinatorial structures, you will need networks that respect the, uh, the relevant symmetries. So that's what we're going to talk about. Um, and uh, at a very high level, uh, graph neural networks look like this. We have our network phi, and as input, it will take some description of uh, a graph and also some input graph feature, and it will produce an output graph feature. So in the next few slides, I'm going to talk about what exactly I mean by description of the graph and by a graph feature. So the, the central problem is, as Hagai was also uh, mentioning, uh, the central problem with designing graph neural nets is that there will be many ways to represent the same graph. Uh, and I'm not even talking about just different encoding schemes like representing edges as tuples of integers, but even within one uh, encoding scheme, like for example, uh, adjacency matrices, which I'll use in my talk, there are many ways to represent the same graph. Um, we see an example here, a uh, graph with four nodes and the corresponding adjacency matrix where we have a blue uh, cell that corresponds to a one. So those two nodes, row and column, are connected. Uh, and you see the matrix is uh, symmetrical because this is an undirected graph. Um, so it, we can, um, if, 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 so to go from the graph to the adjacency matrix, we need to first choose an ordering of the nodes, which corresponds to the ordering of the, uh, the rows and columns of the, the adjacency matrix. If we had chosen that order differently, uh, then we would get a different uh, um, uh, adjacency matrix, i.e. one where the rows and columns are, in this case of, of node one and two, are permuted. But it represents the same graph. So we'll say that these two adjacency matrices, or even in some cases, I'll say graph or concrete graphs, are isomorphic. That's just a piece of terminology. Uh, we'll call these isomorphic. And now it's interesting to note that there are certain uh, isomorphisms, i.e., certain permutations, that will leave the, the, the adjacency matrix unchanged. So in this case, if we swap the second and fourth ro row and also second and fourth column, uh, this matrix stays the same. Um, and that corresponds to the symmetry of this graph. Namely, if we exchange nodes two and four, uh, then uh, clearly the structure of the graph is, is unchanged. Node two and four and their uh, edges, the, they, they play the same role uh, in the graph. So that's as an automorphism is a certain kind of isomorphism that doesn't change the graph. Uh, and we'll, we'll also call that a graph symmetry. Then uh, I mentioned graph features. So the way that we think about this is that a graph feature is a representation of the symmetric group. Symmetric group is a group of permutations. And a representation, what that is, is simply uh, a choice of a, a vector space and for each element of the group uh, a choice of a, a matrix that acts or a, a linear operator that acts on this uh, vector space uh, and these operators they have to be chosen such that the the uh, the composition is the, in the group is preserved so if i have two permutations uh, i can compute their representation matrices and multiply them and that should give me the same thing as first composing those group elements and then computing their representations uh, now, the, the one very uh, important thing to realize is that the representation of the group can be in a dimension that's very different from uh, what you might think of the intrinsic dimension of, of this group, like in the case of Sn, you might think of n nodes. Uh, and for example, here's, uh, uh, here we have a scalar feature on the left. Uh, so the output of your network, um, if you're doing uh, graph classification, it might be a single scalar. Uh, and we want this to be invariant, which uh, is to say that we'll choose a trivial representation. So we have the permutation P12 that swaps nodes 1 and 2, and the trivial representation row 0 of that permutation uh, is just always 1. Uh, so our scalar doesn't change. This is an invariant feature. Uh, another kind of feature that we can, uh, uh, can, can uh, consider is a vector feature where we take one uh, number per node, uh, 
so if you have uh, four nodes in our graph, we'd have four numbers. And the way that the permutations act on this is simply by matrix vector multiplication. So the co uh, coordinates, as you can see indicated by the colors here, uh, the, the coordinates are of uh, entry one and two are swapped. And similarly, uh, you can have a tensor feature where now the permutation acts by conjugation. These are all examples of representations of the same group. Uh, you can have many other kinds of representations. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, um, I think it's very useful to, to think in terms of representations. So for example, in this case, the tensor feature, rather than saying this is the, an SN subgroup of SN squared, I would say this is just a different representation of the, uh, of the symmetric group. Um, so uh, so uh, anyone in this field, I really encourage you to study a little bit of uh, representation theory because it, it's a really systematic approach to uh, equivariant nets. And also because a lot of uh, representation theory is, is um, well, mathematicians have studied this for a long time. Uh, so you can glean very useful results uh, from that literature. Uh, in fact, a lot of the, the work on graph nets uh, in recent years has been slowly rediscovering the representation theory of the symmetric group, um, which is probably uh, over 100 years old now. So um, that's what a representation is and what a graph feature is. Um, so then a uh, popular approach to build equivariant graph networks, uh, probably uh, I would say the main alternative to message passing uh, is what we call global equivariant graph networks and uh, uh, what actually Maron, uh, uh, Hagai Maron talked about uh, just now. Uh, so here the idea is that uh, where in my previous slide, uh, uh, one of the previous slides I said phi, the graph network, is a function of g and f. Now what I'm going to do is to take g, view that as an adjacency matrix and say okay I'm going to interpret that as a second order graph feature, transforming like a, a matrix by conjugation with the permutation. And I'm just going to stack that along with any other features, uh, graph features I might have. Uh, and then the network will uh, apply linear, nonlinear layers and output some, uh, yeah, some output uh, graph feature F prime of a certain type. And clearly we will want this network to be equivariant. So the row in, the input representation uh, uh, applied to the input. Uh, and then applying the network should be the same as first applying the network and then applying the output representation. And clearly the input representation would act in this second order way on G and potentially some other way on, on F. Um, okay, so, uh, and as uh, Hagai also uh, talked about, uh, for different, depending on the order of the, uh, the, 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 the graph feature, uh, you would get a different number of parameters. So if you're mapping an order uh, one feature to an order zero, zero feature, uh, you would have just one parameter or mapping uh, order one to order one, uh, you'll have two parameters. Basically you can sum all the input uh, coefficients or you can uh, copy them. Uh, and for order two, you get 15 parameters. Uh, so that's great. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, these are beautiful results. Uh, but this is fairly uh, you know, low number of parameters. Um, and so the question is, are we over constraining these layers by requiring uh, permutation equivariance? So we'll ask this question, uh, could we use a different weight matrix for each graph, i.e. for each adjacency matrix? In principle, if we just look at the, the basic form of the graph network function, takes a graph, uh, that is to say an adjacency matrix and a graph feature. And so we could just do uh, have a, uh, you know, in theory, just a lookup table. What uh, adjacency matrix is this? And what weight matrix am I going to use then to multiply the uh, graph feature? Um, but aside from that being a bit impractical, it's also, uh, you know, not a valid approach this because this would not be isomorphism invariant, i.e. we would not treat isomorphic graphs in an equivalent manner. Uh, what we need instead is to add a constraint uh, so we, we do start off with a different weight matrix for each uh, possible adjacency matrix, but then we add a constraint which says that each, for, well, for each isomorphism we add a constraint. And some of those isomorphisms, as we noted before, they're automorphisms. They don't change the adjacency matrix. Uh, and so for those, um, we get a constraint on the weight matrix. 
Um, and furthermore, two isomorphic graphs, uh, they should share all of their weights. The weights will just appear in a different order. Uh, but importantly, non-isomorphic graphs, they need not share any weights. So let's look at an example uh, where we're just going to consider a message passing network, just to keep things uh, simple. Uh, so here we have a graph, and in message, pa message passing uh, graph network, we would associate a uh, weight matrix with e each edge. Um, and because this graph has a symmetry, it has a, some non-trivial automorphism that swaps node two and four, uh, we'll, we see that the edges that are mapped onto each other uh, are colored in the same with the same color. That's uh, that's the red uh, edges. Um, so after we swap two and four, as, as shown in the center, uh, the adjacency matrix, uh, or sorry, the the, um, the weight sharing scheme as shown in the matrix is not changed. Uh, if we apply another isomorphism that does change the uh, sparsity structure of the adjacency matrix, then still we have essentially the same uh, weight matrix, uh, but it's just uh, you know that these same numbers, the same parameters, are now ordered in a different way. All right, so that's uh, one insight that actually we don't need equivariance, we just need naturality. Um, now our uh, weight matrices are only constrained by automorphisms, which are potentially much smaller group. And in fact, non-isomorphic graphs, they don't have any, they don't have to share any weights. Although in, of course, clearly this is uh, in some cases desirable. Um, all right, so let's look at this from a mathematical perspective. Uh, I'm not going to explain everything in, in great detail, but it's interesting, I think, to see that this is, these situations are very much analogous. And I also want to provide some pointers for, uh, for people who would like to study this uh, more deeply. Uh, so in the equivariant network case, what we have is a symmetry group, uh, G, uh, that is the, uh, the symmetric group, Sn. And we'll picture this as a, as a small category. Uh, which has just one object, and for each element of the group, we have an arrow. And uh, as in any category, the arrows can be composed, and uh, that's one way to think about your group. Uh, in the natural case, we have instead a groupoid. And the way we construct this thing is we'll take the, the set of adjacency matrices, those will be the objects of our groupoid, the dots in the uh, diagram on the bottom right, um, and then what we'll do is for each object, so each adjacency matrix, and each permutation, i.e., uh, uh, well, well, we'll add an isomorphism. Uh, that is to say, an arrow between uh, this adjacency matrix and whatever you get by uh, applying the permutation. That could be the same object if it's an uh, automorphism, uh, or it could be another one. And so the structure of this groupoid is basically you get a bunch of connected components uh, with where each node has some self arrows. Those are the symmetries of the, of the graph. And you get potentially multiple isomorphisms uh, between different, uh, different ways of representing that same graph. Now, a feature space is, uh, in both cases, just a functor from this thing G, which is either a group or a groupoid to the category vector spaces. That's what we call a group representation or groupoid representation, as I talked about before. And a network layer is just a natural transformation. It's a map between feature spaces. The feature spaces are functors. So uh, this is a natural transformation between functors, uh, which is just another name in the, in the classical case where your, uh, your G is a group of, for an equivariant map. Uh, in that case, you get one constraint per permutation. It's a you know, naturality puts some constraints. In this case, one constraint per permutation. And it also says that you have to use the same map for the same linear map for every uh, graph, even if they're non-isomorphic. In the groupoid case, you get one constraint per automorphism and different maps for non-isomorphic graphs. So that's pretty neat. Now, there are several challenges with this. First is that, th that this is a global method. And as most global methods, uh, they don't uh, scale to, to very large graphs. Um, and uh, the second problem is that the vanilla uh, natural graph network, as I've just explained it, 
you know, asking the question, what is the minimal constraint that we would need to satisfy for this network to even make sense? Uh, such a network does not generalize across non-isomorphic graphs. So we have a solution for uh, both uh, in the form of the local version of this, uh, this algorithm. So what we're going to do here is for each node and each edge, we will define a neighborhood. We'll do that in an isomorphism invariant way. So um, uh, define a neighborhood and there's a constraint which says that the, the edge neighborhood should include the node neighborhoods of the start and end node. Um, then to each node, we're going to attach a graph feature. Uh, so we, we discussed what graph features are before, right? They're representations of the symmetric group. In this case, that's the symmetric group of the neighborhood of that node. So we now have a graph feature for each node. And uh, typically we use a vector feature. Uh, so one with uh, one coefficient per neighbor. So this is a change from classical graph networks. Uh, that we use a different number of channels, essentially, uh, for different nodes, depending on how many neighbors they, uh, they have. Uh, but that is not really dictated by the mathematics. It's just a practical uh, decision. Uh, and we'll have constraints coming from the, uh, you know, the wish to make this a, a, a natural transformation. Uh, and the constraints are that the weight matrix for any given edge is constrained by the automorphisms of the edge neighborhood. So if the neighborhood has some symmetries, uh, that will lead to constraints on the weight matrix. And just like before, the weight matrices on isomorphic edges, so edges that have an isomorphic neighborhood, uh, will also share weights. And in order to generalize across isomorphism classes, uh, we will use a hyper network. So that's a network uh, that maps some description of the edge neighborhood to a uh, weight matrix and does so in an equivariant manner. And abstractly, this is once again, just another natural transformation between groupoid representations. In this case, the, the groupoid representations, they, uh, they uh, are functors from the, the, the groupoid of edge neighborhoods to the, groupoid, uh, to the uh, category vector spaces. And the, uh, you know, the, the, the kernels are just, uh, uh, they together form a natural transformation. So here's a picture uh, to make it perhaps a bit more clear. Uh, so here we have a, a graph and we have highlighted two edges, uh, PQ and P prime Q prime with corresponding uh, weight matrix uh, K. And uh, as you can see, these two neighborhoods uh, highlighted with the bright colors, uh, they're isomorphic. You can put one on top of the other, you see that they have the same uh, structure as a graph. And so they will have to have the same, uh, they will have to use the same parameters. They might be stored in a different, you know, the neighbors might be stored in a different order uh, in, the, in the two neighborhoods. And so the, these K, these matrices KPQ and KP prime Q prime, they will uh, perhaps be permutations of each other, uh, but there, there's no new parameters uh, being introduced. Um, and you can, it's also see that these neighborhoods, they have a symmetry. You can uh, sort of flip them over. Uh, and that also means that there are multiple ways to map the blue neighborhood to the green one. Uh, and so we actually have a bit of ambiguity there, but that's resolved because the kernel is constrained by automorphisms. This is the uh, picture of this automorphism. All right, um, so that's, uh, that's a, a sort of basic explanation of, of uh, how the method uh, works. Um, now, to discuss some relation to prior work, uh, if you uh, choose the no node neighbors, neighborhoods to be trivial, so a node neighborhood is just a node itself, uh, then you end up with a classical uh, GCN, graph convolutional net. Uh, if you choose something like a rectangular grid or a regular grid on the icosahedron, as we used in our paper on uh, gauge CNNs, uh, then you will actually reproduce uh, a, a group equivariance convolutional network. Um, for those, uh, those spaces. Uh, then there's the work by uh, Kondor et al. on covariant compositional networks. Uh, and here they have a similar idea uh, in that the nodes now have these uh, variable size uh, feature spaces that are representations of the neighborhood. Uh, 
um, and they choose to make this neighborhood increase uh, with depth. So it corresponds to the receptive field of the node, which clearly increases with depth. Um, and they constrain the kernel by the permutation group rather than the automorphism group, which is uh, typically smaller. Uh, and uh, yeah, you've just seen the, the work by uh, Maron et al, uh, which uh, I've also uh, contrasted with this work where we, uh, where uh, the graph is interpreted as a second order uh, uh, graph feature. Um, oh yeah, so as promised, uh, synthetic experiments only. Uh, so here we have two graph, graphs that are not isomorphic, uh, but uh, as is uh, now fairly well known in the community, uh, a classical GCN will not be able to distinguish uh, these two. And in fact, some other um, you know, more sophisticated methods also can do it. Uh, but a, a natural network has, uh, has no problem with this. Uh, here we have another example where the two graphs are actually isomorphic, but there's a different signal. Uh, and our goal is to classify these, uh, which signal uh, we're getting as input. Uh, but we're trying to make that classification based on the topmost node, uh, based on its activations. Uh, now, because the central node will have to sum the uh, messages coming from its neighbors, and because all those edges will have to share exactly the same weight matrix in a classical GCN, uh, it has to necessarily forget the information about where, uh, about which neighbor sent which message. So, um, and again, a natural uh, graph network doesn't have that that problem, and so it can uh, learn to solve this uh, this problem easily. All right. To summarize, um, graph networks must uh, respect graph symmetries, and they must treat isomorphic graphs equivalently. Uh, graph symmetries are to be formalized as automorphisms, which is not the same as uh, any permutation of nodes. Uh, and by exploiting local symmetries, uh, we get a, a powerful new, new kind of uh, graph network that's uh, also scalable. Um, that's it. Thanks for your uh, attention and uh, happy to take questions. <laughs> Thank you uh, for that talk. And there's a few uh, questions. So one of them is, uh, uh, what uh, would you recommend as a good tutorial uh, introduction to representation theory? Hmm. Uh, yeah, good question. So um, I really like uh, the book by uh, Serre, uh, S-E-R-R-E, -R -R -E, very famous mathematician. He wrote a book uh, called uh, Linear Representations of Finite Groups. Uh, studying the finite case is, is easier and it already gets you the flavor of, uh, uh, of representation theory in general. Uh, in, in at least in the tractable cases like compact uh, groups, um, and you only need the first couple chapters. It go, this book goes really deep and it's, uh, it gets very sophisticated over different number of fields and whatnot. But you just need the first couple chapters. Um, that's one. And the, the other thing I like is uh, well, Rizi Condor wrote a thesis, um, I think uh, 2008 or something. And uh, this also has a very good um, pedag pedagogical introduction to representation theory uh, that's really aimed at um, you know machine learning researchers. Uh, and then you know in in most of my papers I try to also explain uh, at least the, the main concepts that we need. Uh, in particular, in our papers on steerable CNNs, uh, we cover uh, quite a bit of that. But that's that's perhaps a, a bit um, you know too compact if you really want to uh, understand uh, this. Uh, but once again, it's not that sophisticated. It's uh, you need to understand groups, and you need to understand linear algebra, and then you can start learning representation theory. It's a beautiful subject. Yeah. Great. So another question is about if you could comment uh, on the computational efficiency of um, equivariant neural networks in general. Maybe this is like a broader, uh, broader topic. Uh, but like, uh, you know, at the, on the very, very first slide, you show this comparison, like data augmentation can be outperformed, but <clears throat> in those experiments, uh, you know, was it uh, computationally fair as well, or uh, how, 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 yeah. Yeah, um, so uh, in most of these, uh, most of our papers where we apply these uh, rotation equivariant convolutions, um, we, we test in two scenarios, one in which we keep the number of parameters the same, and one in which we keep the number of channels uh, the same. Uh, if you keep the number of parameters the same, then uh, in, a, in a GCNN, you will have more channels. Uh, 
and so also more uh, computational uh, cost. There's also a tiny bit of overhead from uh, constructing the, the filters as a, as a, you know, to, to basically to implement the weight sharing scheme. Um, but that's, that's not very significant. But if you increase the number of channels, of course, that's going to increase uh, computation cost. And we also test uh, the uh, you know, equal number of channels, in which case we get fewer parameters. Um, so if, if uh, and usually what we find in both cases, you get some improvement. If you add more compute, you get more improvement. Um, and, uh, you know, it depends a bit on the application. I think what is a fair comparison. So my way of looking at these medical uh, problems is, uh, you know, computation is important if you want to, uh, for training mainly. Uh, it has to be at all feasible to do the training. Uh, but that's a problem that will kind of solve itself in a few years when you have better GPUs, then you can have a 2x or 3x bigger network distance, no problem. Uh, and also at inference time, uh, you know, if you have to wait five minutes for your scan to be analyzed, is that is that a, a real problem? You can do it in the cloud in parallel. So for those types of applications, it's not a, a big concern. And fortunately, uh, these medical problems are one of the main areas where this works very well. Uh, if you, uh, you know, have a self-driving car that has to do live uh, uh, analysis of in images in a low power way and so on, then I, I wouldn't imagine that uh, for the foreseeable future, uh, at least some of these methods would be too expensive, or at least you would have to run them in the equal compute mode and perhaps see uh, uh, less gains. Okay, great. So um, actually, Hans Ries would like to ask a question. Let me see if I can enable them to talk and they could ask their question. Hans, if you can. Uh... Oh, yes. Uh, thank you. Ah, this isn't my picture, but that's okay. Um, so why groupoids and uh, not just a general uh, small category? That's my first kind of thought. And, my, my other question is, um, wh what is actually going on in this like natural transformation that is like proceeding with these convolution like things? Mm -hmm. So um, certainly the concept of natural transformation can be uh, applied to any category. Uh, so uh, that's, that's one part of the answer. Uh, the reason we need a groupoid is because here we're thinking about a bunch of objects, namely these adjacency matrix ma matrices, some of which have to be deemed equivalent. And in fact, there, there's uh, multiple ways in which they are can be equivalent. So if there's a symmetry, uh, there are multiple isomorphisms between uh, uh, two, two ways to express the same graph. Um, and that uh, happens, that structure happens to be called a groupoid. Um, and so that, 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 that's the answer why we use groupoids in this particular uh, piece of work. We want to capture that uh, all those ways in which two adjacency matrices might be uh, equivalent. Um, and right. But what, a groupoid, I mean, we require all the arrows to have um, an inverse, right, in the base category. Mm -hmm. And so we're looking at representations of groupoids, which is a particular choice of vector space to every node in the groupoid and a linear transformation. So what are these linear transformations doing here? They're somehow synthesizing activations of the nodes. Is that correct? Yeah, so, um, so what you would do is for each adjacency matrix, you choose indeed a vector space. Uh, and so in a global case, the, the practical thing to do would be to just choose, uh, you know, the same RN. You don't have to do that, but that, that's, that's uh, basically the only thing we know how to do. The concrete vector spaces we work with in a computer, they are our RN for some N. And uh, because uh, for at least for equivalent um, adjacency matrices, you have to choose the same N. The, the vector spaces have to be isomorphic. So you choose RN. That's, that's your only choice. Uh, and then uh, for all the, uh, well, then you get a, a, a representation of your automorphism group. So for each automorphism, you have to choose a matrix that maps Rn to Rn uh, and has to respect the composition law. So that's what we're doing, choosing a representation of the automorphism group. And then also for uh, 
for you, you want to be able to say, you know, if I have this vector, uh, f this feature rep, uh, uh, corresponding to a certain adjacency matrix, then there, if there's an equivalent adjacency matrix which, with its own vector space, then you have to say what is the equivalent uh, feature for that graph. Uh, and uh, if uh, this has to also then interact properly with the uh, new representation of the automorphism group. Uh, and so basically those will just be typically also perm permutations of, uh, of the, the coefficients of your feature. Thank you. Uh, if there's a reference, that might be best. And maybe I'll send you an email. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, feel free to email me. And um, uh, we have a paper called Natural Graph Networks on Archive, but we're still uh, working on um, uh, simplifying some of the, the explanations and also generating more results. But you can have a look at that to, to start with. Thank you. Thanks. A very quick question, which framework you use for practical implementation and whether there is a good framework for graph nets already? Uh, yeah, we used uh, so PyTorch uh, together with uh, uh, I forget the name, but it's a uh, it's a library for for uh, for graph networks. Uh, this doesn't require anything too too exotic uh, to implement. Okay, great. Thank you very much.